So I am Alexander Meyer. Uh, I'm here thanks to uh, Kate Clugston who invited me, which is wonderful. Um, and I'm very glad to be here. This is actually my second trip to, to the New York Google offices, which is very exciting. It all feels slightly familiar now. Um, but I am from the University of Western Ontario, uh, AKA Western University, depending who you ask. There's a whole marketing kerfuffle that we could talk about at some point. Um, and of course here I'm, uh, you know, at Google, uh, and it is May 6th, uh, 2015, and we will come to talk much more about the fact, can we call it a fact, that it is May uh, 6th, 2015 in just a minute, um, as we talk about uh, time and culture in ancient Greece and Rome. And just a little bit about me, um, because this stuff becomes relevant as I talk about what I'm going to talk about. Um, I am an ancient historian, specifically a Roman historian, and my specialty is Latin epigraphy. So I uh, spend most of my time going through old books, um, which have then lists of inscriptions from the Roman world. Uh, most of these are in Latin. Some of them that I read are also in Greek, and we'll talk about a couple Greek inscriptions today. Um, and they are on all sorts of material from I mean, largely on stone, um, also on bronze, on wood, um, and on you know, little pieces of copper, all sorts of stuff that we can find. And I'm basically interested in anything that has writing on it, more or less. Um, and I use this type of evidence specifically to think about issues of identity in the ancient world. And I'm particularly interested in the ways that different cultural groups, um, however we define them, whether we think about terms like ethnicity or geography um, or anything else that you can think of that might um, divide groups. Race is something that I think a fair amount about. Um, and I'm interested in these things and how they're expressed in the ancient world and how that might affect our understanding of them in the modern world as well. And we'll return to the modern world well, momentarily now and then at the end as well. Um, and I'm interested in a few other issues as well. Um, one of these is travel, and that's, of course, a way that um, different groups around the Roman world and the Greek world, the ancient world in general, uh, interacted with each other. Uh, and I'm also interested in maps and geography, so the way that people perceived the world. And this got me interested long ago um, in perceptions of time as well, and the ways in which uh, we can see in the ancient world people's perception of time. Um, and some of this comes through with uh, calendars, specifically, which is the stuff I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and we can see by looking at calendars from the ancient world, um, strangely enough, a lot of the ways that people interact with each other. And we can actually even start doing this um, by thinking about the modern world as well. And as we think about the calendar and the fact, we shall call it, though um, this is very subjective, that it is May 6, 2015. Um, and the other ways that we can think about that in the modern world and think about how um, these things interact with each other, um, and then how the same sort of thing happened in the ancient world. And we can see calendars um, and clocks, and we could talk a bit about clocks as well, um, as signs of identity uh, formation and interaction as well. And I'd like to show you about five examples of how this was possible in the ancient world um, throughout today. Now, um, the first thing to do, though, is to think about this idea of the date. So, as I keep saying, the fact that it is May 6th. Um, 2015. There are all sorts of other ways that we could express today's date. Uh, you can see on this slide, of course, um, if we go back to the um, old Roman way of expressing dates, we would call this uh, the day before the, no the knowns of May um, in the year uh, 2768. Right? That is, of course, the year from the founding of the city of Rome, the legendary founding of the city of Rome, anyway, in 753 BC. We should talk about what BC actually means as well. Um, but we call it May 6th, 2015, by the Gregorian calendar. Right? And the Gregorian calendar is an interesting one. Um, it was invented, not really invented, instituted um, by Pope Gregory the 13th um, in October of 1582. So if you think about the grand scheme of time, of course, this is not even a, a blink. Right? Only in the last few centuries, really, have we reckoned this bit of time. Um, but it's an interesting way to think about the world. It's, of course, a modification of the older Roman calendar. We'll talk about the formation of that um, under Julius Caesar and a modification under Augustus um, before Gregory. Um, but its adoption is an interesting story as well. So it was instituted by Gregory in 1582. Um, it was then adopted um, in Spain, Portugal, Italy, and Poland, also in 1582. You can see within that, of course, a correlation, still a modern correlation, between this relationship between the Catholic Church and nation states. And so these Catholic countries are then adopting this calendrical system uh, that was introduced by the Pope in the 16th century. Um, however, not everybody did this. Um, for example, the United Kingdom, the UK didn't actually adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1752, so a couple hundred years later, just about. Um, the Ottoman Empire didn't assume it until 1917. So getting even further along than that, um, Russia adopted the Gregorian calendar uh, in 1918. And then the Soviet Union uh, adopted it in 1922. 
So we're getting very much into the, into the modern world here. Um, and Greece didn't actually adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1923. So, um, and you can think about that as a different interaction. We see some of those others. Um, well, the first, of course, the UK, is the interaction between the Protestant church or, or churches um, and the Catholic church, and then the Eastern Orthodox and Russian Orthodox churches as well, and all of these things then leading to some sort of agreement. Um, but then we can also look further afield as well. Um, China didn't adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1912 or 1929, sort of a piecemeal process in China. Um, and India, Libya, and Persia, that is Iran, of course, um, still use different calendars today, for certain purposes anyway. Um, and as I mentioned before, the Gregorian calendar is a modification of the earlier Roman calendar, what we'll refer to for argument's sake as the Julian calendar. Um, and this is a solar calendar that was implemented by Julius Caesar. Um, he set it up in 46 and the calendar actually started to be used in 45 BC. Uh, and it replaced an earlier lunar calendar to which I'll return in a few minutes and then again was modified um, by Augustus in 9 BC. Um, the year numbering system that we use at various times is also an interesting thing to think about. So to think about that we use, say that it's 2015, the Romans would say it's 2768. Um, the numbering system that we use is basically attributed to Dionysius exegesis. Um, and it's, re it's replaced a previous um, system of calendrical um, dating. Uh, but going back, well actually this is this is a system that we no longer particularly use. Um, but Dionysius, right back, well, you, you, yes, Dionysius replaced a calendrical system um, which had been based on the, what's called the Diocletian, Diocletianic era. I mean, this had picked up at the accession of the Roman emperor Diocletian in 284 CE. Uh, and Dionysius established this system then in 525, so about a century later. Um, and that gets us to our sort of AD, well, it gets us moving anyway toward our AD um, BC dates. If we think about this question of AD and BC, it's an interesting thing as well. And I think as my lecture goes on, you see that I mostly use CE uh, and BCE as we go through. And this is a replacement then, of course, of Anno Domini and before Christ um, with a less sectarian version of this, which is the Common Era and before the Common Era. Um, and you can see within that expression of time also a very cultural and political element to this. So something, of course, the Western calendar, right, the calendar that we use, the Gregorian calendar, having a lot to do with the Christian church. Um, but then as we get into the sort of more modern, hopefully more secular world, um, a modification of this to be more inclusive uh, and not to uh, pin the calendar to any one faith. Now this is an interesting thing also though, because of course, if you, you know, just go sort of half a step away from what we actually call the date, this is still sort of a religious thing, right? We didn't change the numbers, we just changed the labels. Uh, and that may give you an idea of how dedicated perhaps our, cultural, our cu culture is to incorporating these different uh, other cultures other than the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, and that I'll leave you to think about in your spare time. Uh, write a letter to the New York Times. I'm sure they'd love to have it. Um, right. But this is only, and this the modification then, or the adjustment of AD to CE, is only part of a much larger debate that's going on um, and continues to, to sort of rage um, through the world of calendars anyway. Um, we talked about the Gregorian date here. Uh, we could also talk about the old Julian date. I think I've got that here. Uh, by the Julian calendars, we're actually nine days before the calends of May in the year two, uh, 2768. Uh, from the founding of the city, right? Ob urbe condita. Uh, this is an interesting thing. You can see actually these dates don't match. They're 13 days separated. Right? And this has to do with errors in the calendar um, going back to Augustus when he reformed the previous errors of Julius Caesar. Um, and it has to do with a fact which may only come to mean anything to you if you actually live to the year 2100, right? Which is that the year 2100 um, will actually not be a, uh, will not be a leap year. Um, so 2000 was, but 2100 won't be. And this has to do with the length, of course, of the solar year. Um, and this is something that wasn't realized until relatively recently and then had to be corrected. Uh, right, so the Romans had a slightly different calendar than was corrected, of course, by um, Pope Gregory. We could, of course, also go by the Hebrew calendar, which gives us a different day, right? The 18th day of Iyar in the year 5775. 
Uh, the Hebrew calendar is a very interesting thing. It's, of course, incredibly useful if you do crossword puzzles. It comes up all the time. You know, the months is worth memorizing those, especially if you're competitive about these things. And I only am because the New York Times like, thing on my iPad tells me how long it took me to do a crossword puzzle and then says what the average length was. And I'm just, my personality doesn't allow me to be sub-average. So, I have to do that. It's a pretty great system. I mean, it's a, it's a good calendar. Um, it's a 19-year lunar solar calendar. So it corrects itself every 19 years as the seasons shift and the months will change, of course, in their relationships to the season, which is sort of a difficult thing and not ideal for many purposes, but of course has persisted for a long time. Um, and systems like this have been, certainly been used since the fifth century BC. Um, the year dates, interestingly enough, for the Hebrew calendar um, are based um, supposedly on the time of creation um, and were not calculated actually until the second century CE. You think about how far back these things go. So a difficult thing to do. Um, figure out exactly when this was. And even when we hear about the calculations of when creation was, of course, it is calculated in respect to the Seleucid dynasty. So into this Eastern dynasty when they were and then going back um, to the beginning of the world, theoretically. Um, we can use other calendars here as well. The Persian calendar, um, by the Persian calendar, this is the seventh day of Ordebehesht uh, in the year 1392. Very different calendar. This calendar is still used um, in Iran today. Uh, it was adopted uh, in the year 1925, so not a very old calendar. Um, it begins on March, which is the, the, the time of the vernal equinox, uh, which makes a certain amount of sense. Depending, just depends when you want to start your year, of course. Um, and interestingly, it has been modified since 1925 as well. And from the years 1976 to 1979, the start date of the calendar um, was moved from the Hejra um, of Muhammad to the accession of Cyrus the Great. So the, the system by which they numbered years. Um, and then, of course, this was undone with the fall of the Shah in 1979. So you can see the politics of the calendars were very overtly expressed in that. Um, and this, of course, persists as an official calendar, so something that has to be calculated um, and reconciled then with um, the Gregorian calendar as well. Um, other countries, of course, have their own as well. So the Indian civil calendar is continuing on, also a sort of politically fraught issue um, by which this is the 17th of Vaisakha in the year 1937. The numbers are just close enough that you can actually get confused between the Gregorian calendar and the Indian civil calendar. Um, the start date of this, as we're counting years, um, with, it starts with the Saka era and actually began then um, the numbering um, with the equinox on March 22nd, 79 CE. Only an interesting date to me, well, for this reason, of course, um, but also because that is the year that, that uh, Mount Vesuvius erupted. So, cool, it gets into the Roman world anyway. You wonder if there's some, like, cool um, connection between these two. I don't think so, it's just coincidence. But I would like to think so. That there is a subject for your historical novel. Right? So I like to, you know, just planting seeds here. Just put me in the footnotes. I'll be happy. Um, the Indian civil calendar that was adopted on March 22nd, 1957. Uh, for those of you who know your 20th century history, this is sort of an interesting thing. It's about 10 years then after um, the emancipation or the independence of India. And you can see this as an expression then of the difference and the independence of modern India um, from the United Kingdom. Um, and Prime Minister Nehru um, once wrote, um, they, that is different calendars, uh, represent past political divisions in the country. Now that we have attained independence, it is obviously desirable that, they should be, that there should be uh, a certain uniformity in the calendar for our civic, social, and other purposes. And this should be done on a scientific approach to this problem. Interesting things, that recognition, of course, of the politics of here. We can read that onto the Indian um, British uh, debate, but actually I believe at this point he was speaking about the fact that there were some ridiculous number, and I want to say it was well over dozens, hundreds, of different calendars being used in different parts of India. So very confusing thing. He's trying to find some unity for a new country independent of its previous, um, uh, well, overlord, shall we say, its previous dominating force. Um, my favorite of the sort of now defunct calendars that goes around um, is the French Republican calendar. I think it's absolutely fascinating and it's brilliantly political, right? Um, so this is perhaps the most political of the calendars that we can look at, at least the most overtly political. Uh, this would be, uh, and here's the date here, so Floreal uh, 17th in the year 223. Uh, this calendar was implemented um, by a decree of La Convention Nationale uh, on October 5th, 1793, and implemented then on November 24th, 1794. So this is just in the wake of the revolution. 
of course. And in a world then where, of course, you should see the Gregorian calendar, the power of the Catholic Church expressed through the French monarchy um, is then overthrown, and with it, the calendrical system is changed um, in order that it will re represent um, a more rational and, of course, more egalitarian world in many ways. So they created 12 months then of equal length, 30 days each, and then a six-day holiday period at the end of the year when nobody would do anything, and it was France. Right? Uh, an absolutely brilliant system. I like it a lot. Um, it was abolished, though, not long afterwards in 1806, um, then reinstituted briefly during the Paris Commune uprising of 1871, um, but is now gone. Uh, but it is an, an interesting attempt, and you can also see this as trying to rationalize the world and making equal length months, uh, going back toward the invention of the metric system, of course, and the implementation of the metric system. Same kind of ideal of making the world make sense in a way that wouldn't it be nice if it did? But it does not. Um, until a couple years ago, um, whenever I talked about this, I like to talk about the, uh, the Mayan long count calendar, but we can throw that one out, right? Because it didn't do its thing. The world didn't end. Um, and the dates have gotten much less interesting and much shorter now. We would call it 13-0277, which used to be a big long number, and it was much more fun. Um, but you can certainly think that that's a calendar then in the new world, uh, giving us an idea of the ways that these cultures interact. Now, for you guys, perhaps more scientifically, um, grounded, uh, you can think about different ways and different scientific ways by which we record time. Um, so the ISO 8601 um, date, day three, week 19, 2015, that sounds nice and rational, right, in a way that, that we don't have to translate it really from language to language. Um, the Julian Day is an interesting system by which we can keep time. I think I've actually got this. Do I have it? Here's the Julian Day, right? This is day, God, that's a big number, 2,477,149. Um, it becomes unwieldy really quickly. Um, we can abbreviate this. There's a modified version by which it's 57,149, 48.7 local. Um, and these are dates then um, calculated, the number of days since January 1st, 4713 BC. Right? Again, that BC creeps in. For some reason, we have to use that. Um, and this is a point at which a whole bunch of different calendrical systems actually coincide. So it makes sense when, trans when translating from one calendar to another to use this date. And it's basically for astronomical reasons. Um, and we can talk a lot about this. Interestingly, about this thing as well, it sounds like a very modern idea. Of course, somebody had to have a graphing calculator to make this whole thing work. Um, but it was actually first proposed in 1583. So just about the time of the Gregorian calendar reform. Somebody else said, well, actually, you know, there would be a better sort of more universal way of doing this. And what not really widely used today, but used for various purposes. Uh, and then for those of you who are more fancifully, uh, uh, that sounds dismissive of me, inclined, um, Discordians among you, if there are any, um, the date of the Discordian calendar today is Sweet Morn, Discord 53rd, Year of Our Lady Discord 3181. Right? Uh, not many people use this one, uh, and it's basically an invented calendar. Very interesting for ways of thinking about invented worlds. Um, however, if this religion kicks on, just remember I noted it first, and therefore should receive salvation. Uh, and this interesting start date for this is 1166 BC. So we still have to express this in an AD BC fashion. Um, and although I have written here BCE, so maybe we could, we could you know, sanitize that a little bit by saying BCE, but an interesting phenomenon as well. And then the personal date by which I date all my correspondence, of course, is the star date. Um, and we have to do we think about the exact system that we're going to use for this commonly in use other than just changing the numbers and putting points between them, which I think is kind of cheating, uh, would get us to the, to the day 307,656.16 local, um, or uh, 688,824.7 local. Um, now, I also spend a lot of time thinking about whether you would actually have local time if you were serving in the Starfleet. I mean, of course, there's all sorts of relativity involved in everything, but Starfleet headquarters right, is in San Francisco, so should we be using Greenwich Mean Time or West Coast Time? I don't know. But Another calendar, of course, which you'll find some use of um, at some point in your life. Um, now, there are other ways of dating things, of course, that you guys may be familiar with. Um, specifically, dates um, used digitally, um, used for specific computer programs. So Excel, for example, um, Unix has its own dating system. Um, and these are things that, of course, mean something to some people and not to others and are used for various reasons. Um, and they also have significance, though. Any one of these dates we could all decide to use, and yet for some reason in the modern world, nobody can decide on a single system to use. 
Um, and this is a particularly irritating to me um, in a way. So I live in Canada now. I am American by birth. I spend a lot of time in, UK, in the UK and around Europe. And every time I have to fill out one of those uh, customs declaration cards, I screw it up because I put the numbers in the wrong order. Right? So we can't even decide on that. We can't decide whether to separate the months, days, and years with dashes or uh, points or slashes. And it's just a mess. And, but you will see this. You, right? Whenever I do it and I send a, an email to a student or something, they giggle and they say, oh, you did it the American way. And so there is a lot of identity involved in even these small expressions of time. Now, if we step back a little bit, um, we can think much more abstractly about this. And really, I'd like to step back and talk about ancient calendrical systems. And we can see the same ways um, of these calendars interacting that we can see in the modern world. Um, and once you see this, you will start to see it all over the place. So if we think about uh, Greek calendars, for example, really we can think about Greek and Roman calendars. Um, in their very earliest days, this continued on with, well, we'll see it actually change in Greek calendars. Um, but they started out um, in the Greek and Roman world by using lunar calendars. So these are calendars that are pinned then to the cycles of the moon. Uh, and interestingly enough, each city-state, basically speaking, um, in the Greek world, and this is a world then that after the Greek co colonization period, uh, consisted of cities everywhere from like southern France to the Black Sea, all over the place. And all these cities had their own calendars. Um, they were all basically lunar. They consisted basically of 12 months. Uh, the 12 months had either 29 or 30 days, um, which then, of course, makes an imperfect year. Right? There are extra days at the end that you have to correct for things. So you can't actually predict on what day the equinox or the solstice or anything like that would occur. Um, and this required then a process called intercalation. Right? It just means throwing stuff in the middle of the calendar, but it's got lots of letters, so it makes me sound smart, right? I hope. Um, and this was used, cert well, certainly by the fifth century anyway. Um, there were 30 extra days then added to years three, five, and eight of an eight-year cycle. Right, this eight-year cycle is called octoresis. Um, it was uh, invented, instituted, publicized, something like that, by a guy named Cleomenes of, Te of Te Tenedos. Um, sometime between like 520 and the 430s is when he was living. And during his life, he did this. And Tenedos, in case you're interested, is in Western Turkey. So within that Greek world. Um, now, this meant that in the Greek world, there were innumerable basic basically innumerable calendars that had to be negotiated in some way. And if you wanted to accomplish anything on a specific date, you had to figure out what date it was in the city that you were going to or that you were in or from where the person you're dealing with came from, where you both came from, depending where you are. Um, and it could be a total mess. And this leads to things um, in the archaeological record, in the epi epigraphic record like this, which makes no sense to anybody in the world, right, unless you read Greek, um, in which case it looks something like this. So this is an inscription um, written in Greek, obviously, as you've already seen. Uh, and it comes from Delos, so an island, one of the big islands uh, in the Aegean. Uh, and I just want to read it to you. And we can see within the sum of this interaction between two calendrical systems. So it says gods. The Amphictyons. So this is a council um, of four or five um, people from Athens who are then um, in charge of the temples in Delos. And Delos at this point, um, and this inscription is from 377, I believe, um, perhaps 373. Um, do I have to say BCE? I guess I do, because that's the way we're going to keep track of these things, right? The Athenians would actually use archon dates, as we'll see. Um, so 377 or 373 BC in Delos. And the, Athens had basically been in control of Delos for a little over 100 years at this point. And this is interesting if you read this, as we read this inscription. So gods, the Amphictyons of Athens enacted the following. And this is a, a decree about um, finances of these temples. Uh, from the archonship of Callias to the month of Thargelion in the archonship of Hippodamus in Athens. And on Delos, from the archonship of Epigenes uh, to the month Thargelion uh, in the archonship of Hippias. Right? And then it goes on, it talks about some expenditures and things, uh, and then it comes back to this issue and it says, the Amphictyons of Athens enacted the following, so the second part of this, um, from the month of Scythophorion in the archonship of Hippodamus to the archonship of Socrates, Socrates uh, in Athens, and on Delos from the month Panemonos, Panemos um, to the archonship of Perithos. And you can see within this, then, two different calendrical systems at work. Right? So they're saying exactly when this was done by the um, Amphictyons of Athens. Uh, and it gives the dates for it in both the Athenian calendar and the Delian calendar. Right? So people should understand in either place exactly what these were. Now, within this, you can see the workings of the calendrical systems as well. These archons, so the head magistrates of the city-states, 
um, who are then in charge and by whom we're going to date years. This raises really interesting questions about how people in the ancient world perceived the future. That's a different paper, right? But if you're going to name every year based on who's in charge and you don't know who's going to be in charge in the future, how do you refer to those years? Right? Interesting thing. Forthcoming book. Okay. Um, an interesting thing. So, um, and we can see within this also that Delos and Athens have different names for their months. And we can go through and look at a whole bunch of these inscriptions, and if you look at a bunch of them, eventually you can line them up and you can figure out which month relates to which month. And basically you figure that uh, Delos and Athens had years that started six months apart. So they were as different as they possibly could, but you, as it possibly could be. Uh, but you can basically match them up. Now, once you look at a bunch of these two, though, you figure oh, the numbers don't actually work. Things are slightly different. That's because they're intercalating their, com their, their years differently as well. So on some years, the Athenians would throw in an extra month to try and correct the calendar. And in some years, the Delians would do it. And those weren't necessarily the same years. So you would have to know then how people were going to change their calendar in order to predict a date in the future. Um, and we don't have much information about how exactly they decided when to do this. But we know in the Roman world, it was basically an arbitrary decision a lot of the times. But if they're following this octoresis um, cycle, you should be able to predict within that eight-year cycle exactly when they're going to introduce months. You have to do that. So clearly, there must have been somebody in charge of calculating dates. Um, and he must have been, or she, um, very good at it. Uh, but you can see the complications, then, of these groups um, working together in order to do this. Um, right. And remember, of course, that this is all while Delos is politically um, subject to Athens in many ways. So the Athenians probably could have forced them to change their calendar if they wanted to, but they chose not to. Right? Or the Delians were so attached to their own calendar that they were determined to keep it separate. So you can see this fierce independence in the Greek world. And we can see this in other inscriptions as well. So another one, and this is a very a relatively small transaction. This is not between archons or anything, between individuals. Its subject matter is slightly unfortunate, <coughs> but fortunately, um, hopefully largely a thing of the past. Uh, but this is an interesting inscription. So, um, where, when Aristoteles, son of Aristarchus, was general of, of the Phocaeans, so this is a different part of the Greek world, um, in the first month, so they're naming their months basically just on what order they come in. Uh, and at Delos, uh, Xenius, son of Byblos, or Byblos, was archon in the month Herios. Uh, Aristeus, son of Aristodamos, um, of Styrus, sold to Pythian Apollo a male slave whose name is Protos, son of Protos. Um, of Sidonian race for the price of eight, eight minas of silver. So you can see that these complications then of calendrical dates continue on to personal transactions as well. So here you have somebody who's selling a slave and he's got to give this date and give it in two different ways. So it becomes very complicated um, anywhere in the ancient world. But you can see again another place, um, this, the Phocaeans then preserving their own calendar through this period as well. Um, so the same kind of thing. And we can match these calendars up again. So you've got here the Herios was the 10th month of the Delian calendar, um, but this is then happening in the first month of the Phocaean calendar. So things get extremely complicated. Um, and one could continue with this with a whole bunch of other Greek cities. Uh, we have, fortunately, thousands and thousands of uh, Greek inscriptions, uh, many of which have dates on them. And you can go and map them all up um, and thereby give yourself an aneurysm um, and make yourself, I don't know, probably fall into a bottle of scotch. Um, but through all of this, you can see within the Greek world this fierce determination to remain independent. Um, and this goes back to the very ideas, some of the fundamental ideas of the Greek world, which is that of the city-state, and the self-governing cities. Um, this was something, that, of course, that made the Greek city-states very interesting, um, created things, we could say, like democracy and all this, or political experiments of various varieties. It made Greece uh, a difficult place to be, of course, and things like the per um, you know, wars with people from the east because they didn't unite very well. It allowed, in some ways, the Romans to conquer the Greek world um, because, again, they couldn't put together an army to resist Roman expansion. Um, but this is sort of symptomatic of, of these types of interaction. And you can see these dominant forces then still not subjugating people in terms of their calendar. Um, we can see something very different, though, happening in the Roman world. Um, and we can even see interaction between the Greek and Roman world. Um, so, the Roman calendar, we think about it, was theoretically set up by King Numa, who was the second king of Rome. Uh, and it operated a calendar which was separate then from any of the Greek calendars. Um, supposedly then in the 8th century, um, Numa, again the second king of Rome, uh, to whom are ascribed many of the religious practices of Rome. 
So the first king, Romulus, was like the warrior, right? And he fought to create the city and expanded a little bit. And then Numa came in. And he was like, so everybody just calm down. We need some religion here. We're going to call, like, you know, create a culture, and then we can think about expanding again. And one of the very first things he does then is establish a calendar. You can see this in this quote. So his first act, that is Numa's first act, of course, was to divide the year into 12 lunar months. Uh, and because 12 lunar months came, to, came a few days short of the full solar year, he inserted intercalary months. And so these are extra months to correct the calendar. So that every 20 years, the cycle should be completed. So this is clearly different than the octoresis that we saw with the Greek world. Uh, the days coming around again to correspond with the position of the sun um, from, which he had, from which they had started. So they're realigning the calendar then with the solar year. Uh, right, so you can see within this, of course, the fact that this was done so early, or at least ascribed to such an early date, and this is by Livy, who's writing in the first century BC, um, that at least with the Augustan period, the calendar was thought about as being such an important thing that it must have been very, very fundamental to the establishment of the city. And it seems that this 12-month calendar probably replaced a 10-month lunar calendar. We don't even need to talk about 10-month lunar calendars. They're a disaster, right? Why you would do that, I don't know. I guess if you like the metric system, you give it a shot, but you're going to find that there's a little over 12 lunar cycles in a year, so it's going to get messed up. Um, and we see this then as establishment of the calendar, as, and, and this becomes important, as this symbol of the creation of peace. Right? So something when it's peace, you can correct a calendar and make order out of the world. Um, the system that, that Numa set up is not very well understood. Um, by, but by 450 BCE, um, attempts have been made to regularize the calendar through intercalation. So this group called the Second Decemviret, so the second group of 10, um, seems to have tried to establish a regular system. And we end up with a calendar that looks something like this, which I think that you probably can't see particularly well from your seats. But I will lead you through it, some of the salient features anyway. So it's a 12-month calendar. Uh, and then you can see 12 months across here. Uh, and then right at the end there, um, one that says inter on the top. That's the intercalary month, intercalary month. Um, so the extra that could be added in order to correct the calendar. Uh, within this calendar, and this calendar dates from about 60 BC, so before the refor reforms of Julius Caesar, there's all sorts of information about culture. We could do a, another hour at least about the ways that you can see culture reflected in a calendar. But um, salient bits that are in there, of course, um, something that's very interesting, you'll see um, the two months that I have marked there that say quin and sex don't have anything to do really with our naming system for months. Um, these are the months that would later be known as July and August. Um, you can see within that, it's a manipulation of the calendar, right? People trying to name months after themselves or having months named after them in this case. Um, the Emperor Domitian also tried to name two months after himself. Didn't hold, though, because nobody liked him. Uh, but uh, I think he was trying to take September and October. Um, but this is the old Republican calendar, so before Julius Caesar and Augustus. Uh, you can see in here also then there are um, days of political action and religious action marked on here. So the ones that are circled um, here um, have an F on them. This is FOSS, meaning that they are propitious days for public activity. Right? Good stuff can happen on a FOSS day. Um, there are labels for N, meaning NEFOS, meaning this is not a good day. Right? When bad things happen, September 11th, that's like that should be a NEFOS day. Right? It's a, a day when, when bad things have happened and may continue to. It's a Roman superstition slash religion. Uh, there are more complicated things on here as well. So there's the Nefasti Publici. These are days when uh, a public holiday. It was, it was not a good day for public work, but could be used for other things. Um, so it was largely a holiday. There are commissial days. You can see those in the bottom left. Uh, these are days in which the comitia, or the sort of assembly of the Roman people met, or at least could meet. Um, there are these endoter in Doter Kissy days, um, which are uh, half days, basically. In the morning was no good, but you could do work in the afternoon. So, you know, that's better than nothing. I haven't had a, a half day since I think I was in elementary school or something. Um, and then there are religious things marked on here as well. You see these things, QRCF. Um, this seems to be the day that the, um, the religious king of Rome right, would go through and decide which, like, what could be done and couldn't be done and in what formulas, religiously speaking. Uh, and then, let's see, oh, here we go. I think I went one too far. Um, and then also marked on here um, in the columns are the days of the week. And this is through a, a nundial system. Um, nundial means nine days, but by Roman reckoning, nine days are actually eight days. So it's an eight-day week. Um, the week is something also very interesting. Think about the establishment of the seven-day week introduced by Augustus, largely um, dominant by about the fourth or fifth century. Of course, we still use a seven-day week today. So we have interesting things about the perpetuation of these calendars. And if we think about the seven-day work week or the five-day work week, 
that's a sort of addition to the calendar of the last 100 years or so. So uh, interesting things certainly to think about. And there are more things on here as well. So there are festivals of various varieties. Um, the Looper Call, you can see all the way on the left there. The Quinquinalia, um, the celebration of the Matres. Uh, there's things, and if we just look at May, I think we can see what's on, in store for us this month. Um, right, and here we get uh, the, the Lumeralia, um, which is an interesting thing. This is all kind of, well, strange. Uh, this is uh, the exorcism, exorcism of malevolent household spirits. Uh, and the idea, the tradition for this, and please feel free to do this at home, uh, is that you're supposed to walk around your house barefoot and throw beans over your shoulders. So, you know, if it works, do it. Um, it's good for it. And I, I have it written here that it's supposed to be black beans. So don't screw up and use red beans or pinto beans or anything. Make sure you get it right. Um, and also, interestingly enough, we learned about May that it's a bad month for marriage, despite the fact that like everybody in the Western world gets married in May and June. So, you know, maybe they didn't have that one right. Um, and then um, we have this, the Aganalia. We don't know, really actually know much about this. It happened on the 21st. It's probably a celebration for Mars, kind of based on the name, but mostly that's just um, etymology. Uh, and then my favorite, uh, which is here, uh, the tubilustrium, uh, which is the, as near as we can figure, the blessing of the sacred trumpets. It's a big one. Mark your calendars for that one. Um, that's coming up. But you can see all sorts of bits of uh, culture wrapped up in that. Um, now, the Roman Republican calendar was very imperfect, though, and it largely had to do with the implementation of those intercalary months. Because the implication of those, the the implementation of those months came from the pontifices, right? Which means the priests. One pontifex means bridge maker. A whole bunch of a college of pontifices, and they got to make decisions about when to or not to have an intercalary month. So not even using that octoresis um, process that we that we talked about before. Uh, and this then led to a fair amount of arbitrary work that could be done at this, you know, done during this calendar. And we can see this calendar getting way out of whack at various times as well. So here's an example of this from one of the early books of Livy. Right, this is talking about the year 190 BC. And it's actually not even, not even an early book of Livy, about early times, but late book of Livy. So uh, on those days in which the consul, and that the consul he's speaking of is uh, Lucius Cornelius Scipio, set out for war during the games of Apollo five days before the Ides of Quintilis, right? So that's what, July. <laughs> um, in, a, in a clear sky, in the daytime, the light was obscured when the moon went under the circle of the sun. Okay. The moon went under the circle of the sun. So we have here a note of an eclipse. Right? We're all scientists here of various varieties, except me. Um, we could figure out when eclipses actually occurred. So the date that this inscription gives is the 11th of July. Right? But we know that the eclipse actually happened on the 14th of March. So the calendar then in the Roman world was four months off. Right? So whoever these pontifices were had really screwed it up at this point. And you've got to wonder why exactly they could let it get that bad. Um, by the year 168, it had been corrected, so it was only uh, two and a half months off. So they're getting in the right direction, but still not doing a very good job of keeping this. And we have to wonder why it was that they didn't do um, more work to get this right. If you figure that people are you know, working crops and everything, and they actually predict these things by astro astronomical phenomenon, if you had a calendar that could actually predict when those things were going to happen, you could make plans. Right? It's another idea about what the future was like um, for Greeks and Romans. Um, but part of this is that this calendar under this system could be manipulated. People could use it for various purposes. Most especially among these is if you had somebody who was in office who you wanted to stay in office, you could add an intercalary month and you could get another month of office. It made perfect sense if you were trying to accomplish somebody. If there was somebody you wanted to keep out of office, you could add an extra month, uh, or you wouldn't add the extra month, or you could add an extra month before he went in and he wouldn't be able to go in for an extra month. If you want to just keep ticking along, you would allow it to keep ticking on. And we can see some expressions of this with a highly charged political um, figure as well. And there is no higher, more highly charged political figure in the ancient world really than Cicero. Right, so when Cicero um, was doing his Cicero thing, um, he was sent off to be the governor of Cilicia, 51 and 50 BCE. Uh, and we have his letters, um, letters to his friends and his family, um, and specifically, and most importantly, perhaps to his best friend, this guy named Atticus. Um, and Atticus was an important politician. He was an equestrian, so a wealthy person, but not in the senatorial order, probably for his own decision. He didn't want to be. Um, but Cicero, when he's off to Cilicia, which is in southern Turkey, to be governor, he wants nothing more than to get back to the city of Rome. 
right? His letters are actually hilarious when he's leaving because he's talking about how miserable he is and how awful this is and he just can't wait to get back and he just hopes there isn't a battle because he is not a fighting man and he doesn't want to have to fight. But these letters to, to Atticus are really interesting about this. So um, he starts out by saying, and this is, get the dates right here, the 14th of June in 51 BC. Um, but remember one thing, Atticus, we could add to this. Uh, you are away now when it doesn't arise, but will return in time, so you, have written, right, so you have written back to me. So he's saying that you've gone out of the city of Rome, but you're going to go back according to your letter. Um, so, and, and then he asks him to see personally and through all our friends, Hortensius first and foremost, so another powerful politician, that my year stays as it is and that no new decree is passed. Indeed, while I am about it, uh, I am half inclined to ask you to resist any intercalation as well. But I must not put everything in your uh, on your shoulders. The year then hold fast to whatever happens. So Cicero is out of the city. His enemies are, of course, glad to get rid of him, right? Anybody who, you know, who doesn't like his speeches is glad to get rid of him. He could talk. Um, but he's concerned then, at the first point, that somebody's going to add another year to his term as governor, and he's going to have to stay in Cilicia for more than a year. He really doesn't want that. But he doesn't even want anybody then to intercalate or to add an extra month so that he has to stay in Cilicia for another month. And you can see the way that the politicians would do this. And it seems to be a very real fear um, for Cicero. And as he's sort of off, and presumably just writing letters like a madman because he doesn't really want to be in Cilicia at all, he writes another letter um, a month and a half later on July 26th, 51 BC. Uh, and he says, um, to come back to affairs of the town, that is city, of course, uh, that is the city of Rome. Um, for mercy's sake, as you are staying in Rome, do pray First and foremost, build up a powerful defensive position to ensure that my term remains annual. And I only have to be in Cilicia for a year um, without intercalation even. So he's still concerned, right? And it, now he's not even saying, I'm not going to ask you to do this because it's a pain. Now, a month later, he's like, get me out of here. Right? And he wants to get back to the city. He's very concerned then that people aren't going to let him. Um, now, this problem continued on and basically continued on from this point for another four years or so. Um, and then Julius Caesar... Um, at the end of his civil wars, went through and reformed the calendar, knowing that it was off, knowing that it was being manipulated, knowing that these, well, hoping that these types of political wranglings that led to this sort of thing and the disastrous of 50 years of civil war that had preceded this were continuing during this um, period when Cicero was off in Cilicia, um, that he could correct these, well, he could bring the world back into order, harmonize the calendar, right, the sort of symbolic nature of the calendar, um, and make everything regular again. Um, and he did his darndest to do so. And he seems to have created the perfect system to do this, which is essentially the calendar that we have now. However, somebody misread his instructions, uh, and they put in a leap year every three years instead of every four years. Right? And this just has to do with the Roman numbering system. Right? He said every three years, uh, well, he said every four years, and they counted inclusively as they tend to do, and did it every three years instead. And that got everything screwed up. Um, so it got out of whack a little bit again, and then Augustus cr um, corrected this in about 10 or 9 BCE, implemented it probably in 8. <coughs> and he did this essentially by getting the calendar back on track, right, and then making sure that the leap years would happen um, every four years. Not recognizing, of course, that 100 years that aren't divisible by four shouldn't actually be leap years. That's what Gregory fixed for us in the 16th century. Right? Now, this is an interesting time for Augustus as well. So he held every important, just about every important political position that you could in Rome. Those that he didn't hold, he was in a position where he could just appoint people or nominate them to take these positions, um, except he was not the Pontifex Maximus uh, until the death of this guy that he had been aligned with long before, but had actually exiled in 36, a guy named Lepidus, um, who then had the gall to survive in exile for 25 years, uh, and then died um, in thir late 13 or early 12 BC. And then Augustus could become Pontifex Maximus, which then gave him the power, of course, to correct the calendar, because this was within the authority of the pontificates, and bring the world into order, and something that he did very quickly. Um, and, he, and he commemorated this by building a type of monument. So he erected an Egyptian um, obelisk, which you can see. So here is a Google Earth, of course, um, picture of the city of Rome. Um, just about up here um, is where he erected this thing, a closer picture of it. Um, this is the Palazzo Montecitorio. Uh, in Rome, uh, the Italian Senate House um, is the big building that you can see there, and the obelisk itself is right there. It's sort of distorted in this picture. Don't get distracted by that one. That's the column of Marcus Aurelius. Um, this is about 200 meters, I think, from where it was originally erected, um, but gives us a good idea of what Augustus was actually doing. So here you can see the obelisk, um, and he was using it then as a gnomon for an enormous 
calendrical device, we'll call it. Within academic circles, the debate rages on about whether this was a sundial of the type that you see um, here in the drawings or whether it was just a meridian, meaning just the north-south line within that. All we have preserved for us is the north-south line. You can read a, a huge amount of literature about this, all very fascinating, and form your own opinion, but we needn't do that today. Now, the significance of this um, sort of is, is multifaceted. Right? So there's certainly this idea of correcting the calendar, bringing the world back into order right, in a way that it had never been in the Greek world, although at least it was OK, but really was out of whack in the Roman world. And Julius Caesar then tried to bring things in order in 46, but he was, of course, assassinated in 44. We went back to civil war. And then Augustus, now holding all the power in the Roman world, could bring things um, right and properly into their own uh, or into an orderly fashion. Um, now, the manner which he, in which he did this is interesting. So the, the solar calendar um, is probably related to the solar calendar that had been used in Egypt, like, forever. Uh, and importing that sort of Egyptian model of the calendar into Rome also did something to express Augustus's power, that he had brought Egypt into the Roman world. We'll see a, an overt expression of that in just a minute. And of course, within that power of Egypt, he could then do things like bring obelisks into the city of Rome. This obelisk is almost 22 meters tall. It's absolutely enormous. Again, you can go see it today. Um, and he set it up just about this time that he was um, correcting the calendar. Um, right, and it has all these things to do with his personal power and the power of the Roman people, and then also this imposition of peace, um, as we've seen with Julius Caesar as well. Uh, and here's a transcription of the inscription that uh, Augustus put on the base of this obelisk. So this is the Emperor Caesar Augustus, son of the divine, that is Julius Caesar, right, who had been made a god, Pontifex Maximus, interesting that he puts this here, also a, a single line, just recording that one title of his. Uh, and this is the one that he had just acquired and allowed him to change the calendar. Um, hailed as conqueror 12 times, consul 11 times, holding tribunician power for the 14th time. That's the power that, among other things, allowed him to veto any legislation that he didn't like. Um, with Egypt having been brought into the power um, of the Roman people, dedicated this to the sun. And so he put up this monument um, because Egypt had been brought into the Roman world. You see, this is an expression of the power and the antiquity of the, of the Roman world, though this, this obelisk isn't as old as one um, might suspect, though pretty old by our standards. Uh, but also, that, so yeah, bringing that in and then showing the power, of course, that he can import all of this and regularize the calendrical world. So a very interesting thing. And he was not alone in this type of expression, which we'll see in just a minute. Um, we can see, however, a little bit of this and what the, what the actual device that Augustus built had looked like. So this is the actual paving. Um, this is probably actually maybe Domitianic painting, paving, so paving from later in the first century. Um, but very interesting, written in Greek, so some knowledge of the Greek world then as well, which is no surprise in the Roman world. And each of these marks then um, would have marked where the shadow of the obelisk should have fallen on any given day of the year. Right, going all the way out to the furthest one, which would be the winter solstice. Uh, and then marked on the sides are um, various weather things. So the one that I've highlighted here for you is um, Etesii um, Pawontai, right, which means the Etesian winds stop. These are the northern winds in the Aegean, which don't actually even make it to Rome, really. So it's sort of strange that he would do this. Um, there's another one on there, though, um, that talks about the summer. Um, and then it's got signs of the zodiac written up the edges, so you can track exactly what type of year it is based on this, um, based on this monument. Uh, and here's just a drawing, if you're more interested in seeing what it looks like sort of cleaned up. Now, within the Roman world too, though, this was the, um, the calendar could be manipulated in various ways as well, and still expressions of individuality and conformity um, were able to be um, given. So here's a great inscription, another Greek inscription. I've just given you the English for this one, though, because otherwise it becomes unwieldy, um, which is an idea of the interaction then between the Greek calendar and the Roman calendar under Augustus. So it says, it has been decreed by the Greeks in Asia, so this is Asia meaning basically Western Turkey, most of Turkey, that the New Year's um, first month shall be for all cities in the ninth day before the calends of October, that is September 23rd, which is the birthday of Augustus, in order that each time the day might correspond in each city. Um, the Greeks shall use the Greek day along with the Roman. They all make the first month called Caesar as previously decreed. The Greeks like to repeat themselves in inscriptions. Um, begin with the ninth day before the calends of October, um, the birth of Caesar, Augustus. Right? Computations of the month shall be as follows. Caesar 31, and it goes out and gives the length of each of the months. 
uh, right, and for each month, the beginning of the new month shall be the ninth day before the calends, that is about the 23rd. Um, the intercalated days shall um, always, or the intercalated day shall always be that of the intercalated calends of the month of Zandikos. We can go through and calculate exactly how this all works. It turns out then that Zandikos is March. The calends is the first of March. So putting the putting leap day basically right in where it should be in the Roman calendar. You can see this then, this sort of type of assimilation here, that the Greeks are keeping their own calendar, they're keeping the names and everything, they're keeping their own start date for the year, um, but manipulating it in such a way that it aligns with Rome and of course uh, and honors Augustus. And the introduction to this inscription is also extremely interesting. Um, it sounds like the beginning of some of, well, some Christian texts and of all the like amazing things that it says about Augustus and how his birth was the beginning of the world um, and all of these things. So an interesting phenomenon and way to manipulate the calendar in the Greek world. If you think about that sort of fierce independence that we had seen a few centuries earlier in Greece, you see a very different expression of it, a very um, mollified or softened expression of that in the Roman world. Um, however, um, at the same time though, we can see some displays, um, and this one particular display, of calendrical resistance. Right? Now the, the Greeks were only willing to go so far to change their calendar. Um, but even in the second century CE, when this calendar was made, it's called the Caligni calendar, um, we can see an entirely different calendrical system being used in the Roman world. So this was recovered about 50 miles or so uh, west of Geneva in France. Um, and it is a calendar, but is an entirely different calendrical system than the Roman. It's a Celtic calendar. It's actually our earliest piece of Celtic writing that we have surviving. Um, and it proposes um, a calendrical cycle, a five-year lunar cycle with 60 months in it, uh, which is 12 per year, um, with days varying in length from 30 to 29 days. Um, and its details are fairly poorly understood, um, but you can see in this exactly how different it is from a Roman system. So there are um, names of months on it, which I've just highlighted for you, um, that you can see a little bit. So Equos there and Samon. Uh, right, there are like, well, so there are 29, uh, 29 day months um, end in something called De Vertomu, uh, and you can see that. So there it is right at the top there, kind of just above Samon. Uh, there are good days and bad days, like the Fos and Nefos days of the Roman calendar, which you can see those, Mat and Anmat. <coughs> and Matu it actually is, um, and months are divided in half, strangely enough, in a way that they kind of are in the Roman system, but not um, as explicitly. So the Atenu that you see here means renewal, um, and this sort of continues on through the Irish Celtic tradition as well. Um, as do things like Samon um, and these festivals that we see at various times here as well. Um, without going into great detail of this though, we can see that it is an entirely different calendrical system. Uh, it's used over a century and a half, at least a century and a half, probably closer to two centuries from the time that this part of Gaul had been conquered by Julius Caesar, oddly enough. Um, and yet this calendar continues on. You can see, however, uh, well, you can see great resistance also in that all the festivals that are on this calendar are different from those in the Roman calendar. Um, there are also no um, notes within this calendar of any Roman events. Right? So it can be used completely um, separately from the Roman calendar. Um, however, it is written in the Latin alphabet, right, which shows some sort of assimilation, um, and it is written in a very similar form to the way that you would find a Roman calendar. Inasmuch as, if we go back to the back here, here all this stuff, um, you can see that it is a ni nice, neat columns, and each of the days in the calendar has a little hole next to it. It's a peg hole. Um, it's something that we call a parapegma, um, and of which there are many from the Greek and Roman world. So you can see some cultural assimilation here in sort of using this format for a calendar, which we don't have expressed in any different way. And yet, this resistance by using a calendar which is entirely different than the Roman calendar. Uh, and you can see persistence of calendars in many other ways too. We can track so, or some aspects of this calendar through the Celtic world and the Middle Ages and for a fairly long time. Um, we can see, of course, the persistence of the Roman calendar in as much as we basically use it today. Right? Um, the Catholic Church kind of picked it up, Gregory modified it a little bit, but it's essentially the Roman calendar um, simplified to express it days of the month rather than from the calends, knowns, and ides. Um, and yet, there are resistances to this that have lasted for 2,000 years, parts of the world that refuse to use this calendar even today. Um, and we can think about the ways that calendars sort of shape what we think about. 
Uh, you can think about, of course, Google Calendar, the ways that that actually affects people um, in ways and ways that they envision what their day is going to look like. And we give them, you know, now you have infinite opportunities to envision your month however you like. Right? I use a calendar that shows an entire month on one day because I don't have a lot to do. Mm -hmm. right? Other people have you know, every 15 minutes planned out because they have more things to do anyway. Uh, but we can see these things being very different. Um, even when making a printed calendar or something like Google Calendar, there are infinite choices that one has to make. What um, holidays are chosen um, to appear on a calendar and which aren't. Um, sometimes I just see the weirdest thing appear on the little calendar that I buy from Mead every year. And I wonder, wow, why did they put that on this year? Who knows? It was important to somebody, right? And now these are things that I'm aware of and sort of brings them at least into the mainstream of my thinking. Uh, one of the things that I love about Google, too, um, is that you get the, what do you call it, Google Doodles, right, every day, which are, in a way, a type of calendar, right? It marks something important on every day. Some of those are very weird things that they're put on. Some are brilliant. Some are like, I, they like changed my life, right? Like I learned something amazing every day, and some of them are, you know, this is the day that Star Wars came out, right? But if you think about that as a cultural expression, in a type of calendar, it really affects our lives in many important ways. It expresses little bits of our culture. Uh, but then as you think about calendars uh, and clocks um, in many ways as well, you think about the ways that these affect global commerce and communication. We saw that a little bit um, thinking about the Greek inscriptions. Right? That you have different places that use different calendars but still um, manage to um, conduct business with one another. As you think about this expressing time in a much smaller term, thinking about um, clocks, think about the importance of timekeeping for GPS. Right? This is something, the only way that we can, well, Basically, the only way I can navigate myself any place other than in New York where the roads are nice and straight is having some sort of system to tell me where things actually are. Um, and even within that, if you think about, or even further than that, if you think about commerce, about the importance of timekeeping as far as Wall Street is concerned. Right? Every one of those transactions that go through are timed down to like the picosecond or something these days to which one goes through first. So the ability to keep time and to know time becomes very, very important in just about every aspect of our lives. Um, and it's interesting to see that these things are equally true in the ancient world. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, it's a big subject, but thank you very much. <laughs> Anybody have questions? Yeah? The idea of anniversaries, mm -hmm. what gave rise to those, I assume those aren't always around, but what gave rise to this belief that for whatever reason, you know, 365-ish days after an event happened was somehow significant. Yeah, um, yeah. That's an interesting question. I mean, certainly the Romans celebrated birthdays, right? And they would know when somebody's birthday happened. Um, a lot of that, I think, is astrological. And if you think about the, well, Augustus's birthday is an interesting example of this, that, you know, recognizing that it was when um, the sun was in this position and the stars were in this position that something happened to commemorate that. I mean, I think there's something that's like innately human about commemorating things. I'm not sure that we can get that, um, get to exactly what that is. Uh, but, the, but within these calendars also, there's nothing like, especially something like that, which is above manipulation. If you think about the way that the Roman calendar was when Augustus was born, in what, 63 BC, um, the calendar was a mess, right? It was like someplace between like two and a half and four months off. Um, so. The day he was born, how do you count that? Like, what thing it is? Now, Augustus himself decided that the way he was going to count that was to say that it happened at the autumnal equinox uh, uh, on um, September 23rd, uh, which is the way it's picked up in, in different ways. Um, and certainly, as you can see, religion doing something on the same year is supposed to propitiate the gods in some way. That in some way, it's ordained that these things happen at a given time. But there's also something extremely arbitrary about it, especially when, I suppose, po powerful people become involved. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's difficult to say, but yeah, there is yeah the, the flexibility of of um, dates is an interesting thing. Anybody else? Yeah. How did people arrange to meet up in the era before precise timekeeping? Like day to day. Yeah. Um, well, basically, you you could use the sun as a sundial of sorts, right? At any given time, there certainly were sundials around. Um, there's a, a guy named Richard Talbert who's I think still working. If, if his book hasn't come out, all about portable sundials in antiquities. People just like carried sundials around with them. Problem with that is figuring out exactly where north and south are to get your sundial right. Um, but basically that was it. Um, so at the archaeological site I work at, a place called Vindolanda in northern England, uh, we have writing tablets. Um, and basically the, when you get a time of day mentioned, it's like noon or dawn or dusk. And that's about it. Um, beyond that, you, mean you can use various, you know, Bear Gryllis means of figuring out what time it is, which yeah. is basically to hold your hand up to the to the horizon and then put one on top of another until you get to an hour. 
but that doesn't work very well in you know England in the winter, yeah. right? Because the sun never gets that high. But basically, a rounding way off. Do very simple times rather than very specific times. Mm -hmm. So if you had to be at some place at 3:05, uh, get there at 2:30. Be my advice. Unless you were the more important person, then wait till four. We'll be waiting outside your house. Just the less important person ends up waiting around for basically amounts of time. Yeah, I mean, let's say Rome was a very hierarchical world, and yeah. people built into their houses were these big benches where where their pay, or their um, their clients would just come and wait for them to to turn up. And you, you know, we do this. They don't, they do it in movies anyway, right? Where somebody comes to a meeting and the yeah. guy's in his office not doing anything, it just makes the guy wait for a little while. Yeah. Get the same kind of thing in antiquity, I'm sure. Anything else? Yeah. So since it was so complicated to calculate these times, do you trust historical records when you find them? Like do you say like, oh they said that this month corresponds to that month? Hmm. <laughs> Maybe I should take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you have to be careful about these things, right? So there, there are anchor points that we have in, in times, like things like eclipses, that we can figure out exactly when they happened. Um, the chronology, like, like long length chronology in the ancient world is an extremely dodgy subject. Um, and yeah, I, I got interested into it a while and I realized that there'd be madness. It's gonna drive me crazy. Um, because once you start sort of picking at that house of cards, it's in danger of tumbling at any moment. Um, so we do have to be very careful. Uh, and really what you look for in those situations is some sort of confirmation. And, and we have lists of consuls in Rome um, and various events which we can rely on <coughs> to some point in the past. But there are also points at which you know, the records in Rome were lost and burned. And then we, but we have copies of them, but you don't know if those are the real copies. So you have to be really careful and figuring out, especially the further back you go in time, exactly when things happened. But things get better. And there's still a few debates about this, about the Middle Ages and whether we actually whether we have the right number of years, and sort of what we think about it, used to think about as the Dark Ages now, you know, medieval times, um, and some argue that we're a couple hundred years off. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. It, in some ways, we can correct that by looking at tree rings and things, um, and sort of get a better idea. But yes, you have to be skeptical about dates for sure, and look for confirmation. We try to find independent literary sources for things that aren't using the same literary tradition and just mimicking it, um, and that can be problematic at times. But we do have lots of sources you know, starting in really the imperial period in Rome that are pretty good. That's part of the reason that I stick to Roman imperial history. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned most of these examples of dates actually being used seem to be kind of political, having to do with degrees and things. Are there yeah. other examples of when calendars would be applied, like for agriculture or astronomy? Maybe they weren't useful because it was so ad hoc? Yeah, absolutely. So, the, so I alluded at one point to, the, to a parapegma, right, of which we would have two or more parapegmata. Um, and we have several of these from the ancient world in, in various, several, many, depending how you look at it, of these um, in various forms from the ancient world, some literary and some physical. And the idea was that you're going to move a peg from day to day and tell the time. Um, and some of these are specifically astrological. And so they talk about the rising and setting of stars um, throughout courses of the year. Um, and then some of them are a combination of astrological and agricultural. So that people like Columella um, who write and say, OK, well, you should, and I'm just going to make something up. I am not a farming man, um, that you should plant your corn at the vernal equinox. Um, and it gives us a good idea then of, of how these things were done. Um, and you can see then the importance of calendars um, as we go you know, through history. Um, and this becomes particularly important after the Julian calendar reforms and the Augustan calendar reforms to a, to a lesser extent because you could then count on the same thing happening on the same day. Right? So if you were going to plant something on the autumnal equinox, you knew that the autumnal equinox was going to happen on or about you know, the 22nd or 23rd of September. It really changes the world in a, in a kind of nice way. Um, didn't then require people to do astrological observations regularly, um, but rather it becomes a predictive um, calendar rather than a sort of expressive calendar. So, yeah, and we get these, um, what else would you get? I mean, those are the big ones, astrology, astronomy. And, and in the ancient world, there's a very fine line between astrology and astronomy um, and agriculture. The big, and then there's the political ones. So three or four categories. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. With all these different um, calendars by each of these different city states, how did they rectify them when it came to pan-Hellenic festivals and like games specifically, like the Olympics? Oh, that's so. a great question. Yeah, um, and there's actually a whole field of debate about when exactly those happened, like when in the year. So, so the answer. Would be um, no. Yeah, the answer would be that it was very difficult to do. Okay. Yeah, um, and then so these dates would be announced, and then people would have to calculate the difference in their calendar and know exactly when to arrive. You assume some cities are sort of late because they timed it wrong. Yeah, and there are, there are things about people being banned from the games because they didn't get there in time. 
And yeah, they say that. And so they had to arrive a month early or something, and then people didn't, and they got in trouble, and they didn't weren't allowed to participate. It's all political, though. Yeah. Yeah, to, to get some sort of advantage. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. The question on what are the surviving mediums in which these inscriptions are found? Like, what well, some of the craziest, you know, forms in which they mm. mark stuff down? So the ones that we, the ones that survive to us, um, most of them come on stone, right? I mean, we have only durable materials, mostly. So most of them are on stone. Many Roman inscriptions are on bronze, um, especially we get a lot of them from Spain, um, where they've been, been basically like hammered into a bronze sheet. Um, those are great, except not many of them ultimately survive because they could be melted down and made into something more useful, which people did. Uh, lots of things we know were written on wood, um, we still have preserved from places like Pompeii and Herculaneum many, many inscriptions that were just written on plaster walls, painted on them. Uh, we have inscriptions that were painted on ceramic as well, so on pots and stuff that say what was in them or, or you know, jugs about how much they had or who owned them, like how much was held in it or who owned them. Um, from Vindolanda and a few other places, we have wooden writing tablets. So they're, they're just ink on wood, and we have hundreds of those surviving and know that there, were, there must have been an infinite number of them in antiquity that just haven't, for various reasons, survived to us. Um, I think all sorts of just household implements that have stuff written on them, mostly just names of people, um, sometimes dirty poetry or little bits of verse of some variety, but they come on all sorts of things. Um, what else would you get? I mean, you also get things like mosaics, right? and there's actually writing in mosaics or pieces of glass that have writing on them which are very cool, and it's like it would blow the glass or, or form it in some sort of um, mold. It would put the writing right into it. Those are very cool. Um, what else do we have? I have pieces of armor, weapons, anything. Is it true that people wrote inscriptions on like sling stones, like peltis? With, oh, yeah. Like, say like F Mark Anthony. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you see those little pictures from World War II, right? And they're like, happy birthday, Hitler. And they like, then they send the rocket shells off at the same thing from the ancient world. Yeah, say mostly very unfortunate things about people and members of their family and what they should do with these <laughs> ballista balls when they, when they arrive at their destination. Yeah. Yes? Yes. So is there any uh, correlation between sort of the evolution of the technology and the evolution of these calendars? Because it seems from your talk almost like the, the sort of basic understanding of astronomy is, is more or less there and the, and the variations that are made are largely sort of driven by politics or things like that. But um, I'm just curious as to whether there's any sort of technology sort of running underneath this as an undercurrent as the calendars evolve. Yeah, uh, it, it, there is. So, so when you get to the you know, sixth century or so, um, and really science becomes a thing, Right, um, people are really thinking critically about the world and trying to determine things. Um, you get people like a guy named Meton, um, who um, erected what looks like some sort of um, sundial thing on the Pnyx in Athens, and started to demonstrate that this is you know, this is how the the year progresses and exactly how long it is. Um, and we can he actually proposed a, a different cycle for the number of years and a more accurate one. It wasn't really picked up um, particularly rapidly, but. There are people who are working on this sort of thing. Um, and it gets to the point you know, where, where better and better methods of keeping time, like short-term time, were used. And you could get to a better calculation then of what exactly a year looked like, or what it felt like, or what it is. Um, but there's no, you know, no great leap, really, from the fifth century to the end of the Roman world. You know, to start building clocks in the Middle Ages, and then mechanical clocks. Uh, but we have records of, uh, and this is recorded in Vitruvius, um, of people, make, um, and we know from other sources as well, making water clocks of various varieties. And even Vitruvius records, in a sort of muddied fashion, um, a, a way to build a water clock that could also adjust for the length of days um, at different times of year. Uh, doesn't seem to have worked very well. We may have a couple fragments, two or three fragments of these things um, in the archaeological record but we at least know that they existed. And then there were much simpler water clocks that were used in courts and, um, you know, um, what do you call them? You know, sand things. What do we call those? Hourglasses. Huh? Hourglasses, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, was, ancient science was slow to evolve, especially you know, sort of what you, what you, once they had done what they could with the naked eye, they were sort of stuck. Yeah. Did the Romans impose their calendar on their 
conquered subjects? And did that spread like out of Italy, out of well, the Greek city-states, I mean, as you see this inscription with Augustus, continuing to use their calendar in parallel with the Roman calendar. And we can see that at various times. Um, and then this Celtic calendar, we only have the one copy of the Kalini calendar, but it seems like other people would use their calendar separately, um, and perhaps for separate purposes. Uh, but when we get correspondence from the ancient world, um, it's basically either a Greek calendar or a Roman calendar. Um, but yeah, it's difficult to say whether this was by practice or by force, I mean, the, whether people were using it because it was actually a better calendar or because it was expressed in a common language. So we find things written in Latin. You use this sort of Latin names for things. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there's like no decree that went out saying that everybody will use the Roman calendar at all times. It's a it's sort of haphazard thing. Um, and this is a huge area of Roman studies as well, is to think about the means by which the sort of cultural changes were made, whether this is a, a sort of imperialistic um, projection of Roman ideals on other groups, or whether these groups sort of willingly do things to become more Roman. Uh, and that's very much open to debate, and, and it, it, is, it's, it is, is in itself a sort of political issue. Right? As we're in the sort of post-colonial world, we want to empower the colonial peoples rather than the imperial powers. Uh, and you can see that expressed in, in um, scholarship all the time. It's very difficult to say. That's it? Okay. We can talk after. <laughs> Great. Thank you all.